of Jesus. Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how He changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. He no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love, but I'll never know just why he came to save me, till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus, there's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. But uh, this morning, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4, and uh, we continue our series in Hebrews. We're only going to focus on a couple of verses this morning, and that's 12 and 13. And I want to reiterate what Brother... Jake said earlier that several men worked very hard out here yesterday, and I'd like to personally thank them before I begin to preach. And I think y'all are really going to enjoy that lighted walkway when it's needed. It looks good. And the title of today's message is The Double Edged Sword. Double Edged Sword, verse 12 and 13. Before I read this this morning, I want, let's get a little context here concerning what we've looked at. It really started with chapter 3, verse 7, and it's run all the way through 4, verse 11. There's this continuing line of thought. And what the writer of Hebrews did is he went back to that wilderness wandering, and he used that as an example of losing faith or a lack of faith. And that they started well on their journey out of Egypt, but they got into the wilderness and their lack of faith was evidenced. And almost all of them died in the wilderness there in those 40 years. So he's laid out that argument as the groundwork of a challenge he's issuing the reader to not go back, to not lose faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Stay the course. It's believed that the first readers of this book, the ones that the original audience that he was intended on reading this, probably met under some level of persecution in houses. These were probably house churches, as 
the early Christian church was. They didn't have a nice place to go like we have today to assemble themselves together. Church was mostly in the homes in early, early, early Christianity. And so as they're reading this, the, the challenge being issued to them is stay the course. Don't fall, back, don't fall into sin, but also don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back to the old covenant. There's, there's no hope for you there. Christ has fulfilled the old covenant. Your hope is in him. Even Moses and even the, the fathers of Judaism that you look to, they, they all saw this day and hoped in this day of the coming Messiah and the coming Redeemer. So applying this to us today, the challenge is the same. Even though we're not Jews and we're not being uh, tempted to go back to Judaism, the challenge for us is to continue the course that we're on. Remain faithful. Keep the faith. Keep fighting sin. Keep uh, fighting uh, temptation. And don't go back. Don't go back to where we come from. Don't fall back in love with this world. Don't find more hope in idols or worldliness or popularity, or prestige, or, or money, or sin, or addictions, or immorality. Don't go back to that. Treasure Christ and remain. Keep going. And you know, something I learn more and more as I go verse by verse exegetically studying this book is the emphasis he places on the everyday fight. You know, we put a lot of emphasis, and rightly so. This is not a rebuke. But if you talk to the average Christian around churches around here in the Bible Belt, we put a lot of emphasis on the initial experience, on the day we got saved. And that was an important day. I'm about to talk about mine in just a moment. But we put a lot of emphasis there. And we're not wrong for doing that. But what I see continually emphasized, the further and the deeper I get into this book, is not just what happened the day I got saved, but today and tomorrow, if it should come. That we don't look back to just a day where we accepted Christ and that's it. That every day we remain committed to him faithfully, fleeing from sin, fighting temptation, believing and trusting in the promises of God. Regardless of the trials that we face, regardless of the conditions we live in, we keep believing, we keep trusting in God's promises until the day he calls us home or until the day Christ returns. That's the mission, the goal, and the assignment of every believer in Jesus. And so now we go to the text. I invite you to stand with me, if you will. Only two verses today. But keep everything I just reviewed in context as the writer of Hebrews makes the force of his argument with the word of God itself. In verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let's pray. Father, these two verses are packed with a lot of truth. Your word is living. It is active. Your word is a discerner, Father. Your word cuts us right to the heart and you know all and you see all. Father, it's my prayer that we not lack faith. Father, that we not be guilty of the faithlessness of the wilderness wanderers, but Father, we persist and continue daily, day after day, abiding in faith and in our walk with you. Lord, write the truths of these words on our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I was a teenager at church camp when, let's see, this would have been back in the 90s, late 90s. We were a little mosquito-infested church camp in Memphis, Tennessee that no amount of mosquito spray could defend you from. <laughs> 
But it was there one evening in the service there that God's word performed its surgery on my heart. And I was cut with the understanding that God was holy and I was not. I was cut with the understanding that Jesus died for my sin and that without him I would live and die hopeless and helpless. And that evening, as I wept with conviction, I then began to weep with joy as I encountered the truth of God. And the grace of God worked on my heart with such surgical precision that only God could do. You know, first century Jews and early Christians considered the Word of God in the Old Testament to be this powerful force, this administrating force. And throughout the New Testament, we see that emphasized as well. And we also see in the New Testament the authors associate with the Word of God the imagery of the sword. In Ephesians 6, 17, the Word of God is referred to as the sword of the Spirit. In the book of Revelation, the sharp sword proceeds from the mouth of the Son of Man, a symbol of the spoken word of judgment and the dynamic force with which one must reckon. And that's sort of a theme of this message today. When we see the sword imagery used here in Hebrews or Ephesians or Revelation, the sword is something we must reckon with. I want to share with you several points from the text and I'll close today with some application for us as I always try to do but number one is that God's word is living God's word is living the psalmist says in Psalm 119 89 that God's word endures forever God's word is God breathed God's word is active. God's word is powerful. God's word is alive. And God's word resounds with power as it rushes to fill the purpose for which it was spoken. Listen to what Isaiah said about God's word. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word is living. God's word is active. God's word is real. God's word is powerful. And folks, God's word does not discriminate. God's word does not discriminate based on age. God's word does not discriminate based on level of income. God's word does not base or discriminate based on education or intelligence, or IQ, or sophistication. And the truth of this point that I'm making to begin with is that God's Word can change anyone. That God's Word is alive, that God's Word is powerful enough, God's Word is real enough, that God's Word can change anybody. It can transform the life of a 12-year-old and it can transform the heart of a 90-year-old. There is no one, there is no sinner, there is no depraved human being, there's no person living today and certainly no one in this congregation today that cannot be changed by the Word of God. God's Word is alive, but secondly this morning, God's Word is piercing. God's word is piercing. If we have returned to the text, for God's word, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. And God's word can pierce even the hardest of sinners. But notice he's using the sword imagery and then referring to piercing is that presents the image of God's word as something that cuts. It's something that, it's a dagger. It's something that stabs us and it goes straight to, our, to the recesses of our own heart. But the good news is that God's word can pierce even the hardest of sinners. George Whitfield, 
renowned 18th century evangelist was being mocked one day by a group of detractors. It was a group who called themselves the Hellfire Club. And one of the members of the club was a man named Thorpe. And Thorpe was a brilliant and skilled uh, actor, imitator. On one occasion, Thorpe was mimicking Whitfield preaching a sermon. And he was mimicking Whitfield with an alarming accuracy. He had his voice down. He had his tone down. Even the contortions and facial expressions that Whitfield made during the sermon, he had this imitation uh, down to a T. But as he imitated Whitfield preaching, he himself became so pierced and pricked by the word of God that he sat down and on the spot, he was converted. That's how powerful and piercing the Word of God is. And God's Word itself tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And whether it's in the songs that we sing, the text is read, or whether it's in the sermon itself, God's Word is a life-changing, living Thing. And we can't separate God's word from God himself, but God's word can cut through a hard heart like a hot knife can cut through warm butter. God's word can do that. And number three this morning, God's word is discerning. God's word is piercing, but God's word is also very discerning. We see that in the text itself piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Greek word for discerning in the text is the word kritikos. And we derive from that word our English word critic. The emphasis here of the text, and that's what we need to get, because the text is king. What the text says is what we're to get this morning. And the emphasis of the text here is on the discerning judgment of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's what God's work can do. Every time we read it, every time we come before it, every time we hear it preached, every time we hear it proclaimed, that God's word is a discerner. It discerns the intents of our heart, the thoughts of our heart, the purposes of our heart. God's word can pierce into us, reach into us to a level that no other human being can do. And that we're often not even willing to do ourselves. We can put on a great facade. We can look holy and we can look righteous. We can look spiritual. We can be the most active soul in the church. We can be busy with the church calendar. We can even teach a class. We can be a leader. We can make every fellow human being around us think that person is a true believer. And I hope you are. But what those observing us cannot do, they cannot do what God's Word can do. They cannot discern and they cannot pierce like the Word of God can do. Folks, our heart, what is that? Are we talking about the actual organ? When the Bible talks about the heart, it's not necessarily referring to the actual organ that's pumping blood. What it's referring to is the very foundation of who you are. The foundation of your personality. Your motives, your intents, your purposes. What drives you? What develops your passions? What, what convicts you? The heart is at the center of all of that. And the analogy is perfect because it's our heart that does pump blood. It's our heart that we cannot live without. It's the heart that's at the center of our structure and being and that without we wouldn't have life. Same is true spiritually. The heart is the foundation of the personality. It may be hidden from other people, but God can sift through the heart and he can discover every single motive of the human heart. But what God's word does as we read it and as we meditate on it, as we memorize it, as we study it, God's word tells us much about ourselves. It tells us much about God, but it also tells us a whole lot about us. 
And I can't help but wonder, in the times in my life, when I stayed away from God's word more than I should have and didn't open it as much as I should have. And, and during those times, I would have told you, man, I love the Lord, man, I'm saved. And I believe I, there was a time where I was a Christian and not studying as much as I should. I would have told you all the right things. But what really was the truth that I wouldn't have told you is that there were times where I was afraid to open that word because it was going to tell me a lot about myself that I didn't want to confront. And the reality of this is this, that there's many a closed Bible in the homes of many professing Christians and church people because you know the very same thing I've known at times in my life, that if you open that Bible, you're going to be confronted with the reality of who you are because that's what God's Word does every time. That addiction in your life is keeping you from opening God's Word. Your hardened, unforgiving heart can be keeping you from opening God's Word. Your lust for someone other than your spouse can be keeping you from opening God's Word. Your love of this world and passion for the things of this world can be keeping you from opening God's Word. Your busyness can be keeping you from opening God's Word. And you know that if you open it and if you really read it, it's going to tell you something about yourself. And it's going to tell you something about yourself that makes you very uncomfortable. And it's going to tell you things about God that might make you uncomfortable. Because that's one of the purposes of the Word. It does that. It tells us more about who we are. It tells us more about who God is. And the right response for us is to run to His grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But God's Word tells us much about ourselves. But this does not mean... Everything I've said today, so far... This doesn't mean that God needs us to go to His Word so that He may know our hearts. No. It doesn't mean that we have to go to the Word so that God knows who we are. That's not, that's not what this says. God doesn't need us to read our Bibles to know our hearts. God doesn't need us to interact with His Word to know who we are. We need to, to know who He is. But what our confrontation with God's Word does if we read it, if we study it, if we meditate on it, when we hear it read, when we hear it preached, when we confront the Word of God, it brings us into touch with His perceptiveness. I'm going to say that again. When we encounter God's Word, it brings us into touch with His perceptiveness. Because when we go to that Word, we learn about His sovereignty we learn about his omniscience, that he is all-knowing, that he is everywhere, that no creature is hidden from his sight. And the more we study the word, we, the more we learn about how perceptive God is and that we can hide sin from others. We can hide dark things about our own heart, but we can't hide it from God. And the more we study this word, the more we learn how perceptive is, how perceptive it is. And my last point, and keep in mind, I want to share with you in closing a few thoughts on application, but my last point directly from the text this morning is that God is a reckoning God. He's a God, folks, we must reckon with. And we see that in verse 13. There's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who we must give account. Ladies and gentlemen, we must reckon with the God that this text describes. And we have to understand all of his attributes. I, I, I know we live in a day and time where we like, we like heart, we like warm quotes, we like heartfelt quotes. I, like I've said before, I, I'll use this example again. I worked at Lifeway for two years, and I don't recall ever seeing a greeting card that had Hebrews 4.13 on it. <laughs> we don't. That's not one we're going to put on a 
greeting card and send to someone to encourage them. But all things are open to his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. God sees everything. God and his word cannot be separated. Now, this can be very discomforting if you have something to hide. If you've got something to hide today, that's not a verse you want to hear. If there's sin and immorality that you're hiding, if there's pride in your heart that you haven't dealt with, if there's unforgiveness and a lack of mercy in your heart, if there's a love of the world, an unhealthy love of the world, a sinful love of the world, this, is, this should be a frightening scripture if you're hiding something. You say, well, Justin, why do you want to preach like this today? Because this is how the writer's preaching. He didn't write this verse to warm the hearts of his hearers. Warm them. He did write them to warn them. This is a warning. And the only way to preach this text rightly is to preach it the same way he wrote it. This is a warning. Do not fall back. Do not lose faith. Do not love the world. Do not love your possessions. Do not love your sin. Do not love anything more than Christ. Treasure Christ. Follow Christ. Remain in Christ. Keep the faith and keep fighting the good fight. But don't give up. And don't walk away. And don't prove by your unrepentant sin that you were never really converted to begin with. That's a huge theme of this book. He's not talking about salvation gain and then salvation loss. He's talking about those that profess Christ and then prove in their faithlessness, prove in their rebellion, they, they never knew him to begin with. And he's challenging everyone professing Christ. It was Jews when he wrote it, but it's us today. It's sinful. And, and don't let a hard heart of rebellion overtake us and prove who we, who we really are. But this is a God that we must reckon with. And this can be very uncomfortable if you're hiding something. There was the experience of some boys was long ago, who were stealing some apples, and they thought nobody would catch them. And as they were in the act of stealing apples from the orchard of the tree itself, a well-known American astronomer was seven miles away with a telescope. Samuel Alfred Mitchell was the astronomer, and he's observing the sun, through his telescope, descend across the horizon. And as he lowers his telescope, observing that sun, seven miles away, he zooms in on these boys stealing apples. And they were picking apples, and there's one standing guard making sure they don't get caught. But little did they know that seven miles away, every move they made was being watched. We waste so much energy and effort, or we exhaust so much energy and effort trying to keep people from knowing who we really are. And if we're honest, we're all a little bit more fallen than we really want to admit. And as I've said before, social media is not helping that. It's not. What we often portray on social media, not that social media is all bad. I, I like a lot of things about it, but, but the version of ourselves that we want to sell to everybody else is not always the real version. That's true for all of us. And probably a good, there's some things we probably don't need to advertise, but what tickles me today in the day of social media is we can, you know, and you might could relate to this at times, but Maybe you go on a trip to the park or you go to town or you go to the zoo or something and, and, and you know how it is when family gets together. You, you have fun, but things can happen. You ever had a family outing where you didn't have some kind of glitch or hang up or a little frustration or something and 
you fuss all the way to the zoo, and you are, how'd you forget this? Well, you know, you've been mad at me all morning. And then you get out of the car after fussing all the way there, and let's take a selfie. <laughs> and you post to Instagram or Facebook what a wonderful day you're having with your family. But what you didn't tell Instagram and Facebook is about the argument that morning. We're all a little more flawed and fallen than we really want to admit. And we can fool people, but we can't fool God. And if there's hidden sin that you're not willing to deal with and repent of, the danger of that sin is you can think you're safe because nobody knows. But you're actually in the most dangerous place you can be. Because if that sin remains hidden, if, if God allows you to remain in rebellion and remain with a hard heart and remain unrepentant, then you may stand before him one day and hear the words, depart from me. Folks, sometimes the most gracious thing God can do is expose you for who you really are. I heard a preacher once say the best thing that can happen to some people is for their sin to be on the front page of the paper. Because that means when we're going, some people say, well, he just apologized because he got caught. Friend, if you don't think God can expose you to bring you to true repentance, let me tell you a different story. He can. And he will. He exposed David to bring David to repentance. And so God's all-knowing word, God's living word, that's a very sober warning to those who have something to hide. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And this text that we've read this morning makes it very clear that all creatures, all creatures, all people are in God's grip, completely vulnerable, helpless, and exposed to the eyes of whom we must give account. Quickly, two ways this sword works. One, it's living, it's active, it penetrates through everything and discerns everything at the core of our being and leaves us exposed before a God whom we must reckon. But also for the believer, how does the sword work? The sword just doesn't expose the one in rebellion. It doesn't just expose the lost person. The sword continues to work in the life of a Christian as a sanctifying sword. I remember the day I first got cut by this word, but you know what it keeps doing? It keeps cutting me. It keeps piercing me. It keeps exposing me. And every time I go to it, God does some more gracious cutting in my life. And I hope that's true for you. How do we, what are some things we can take away from this this morning? One, in closing, exegetical preaching and reading of scripture are foundational for the church we must every time we gather every time we teach Sunday school training union every time we gather the word is to be read spoken and preached and folks honestly this is why sometimes our hearts don't like expository sermons because expository preaching always preaches what's there. Man, you can make some topical sermons that feel so good. Let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> but when you read Hebrews 4.13, it just got real. But exegetical preaching must be part of our lives. Exegetical Bible study must be part of our lives. Folks, those 90-second daily devotionals from Lifeway are great, but that's not enough. That's not enough. We think if we've read one verse and a paragraph that followed before we brush our teeth that we've studied God's Word. That's not true. We need chapters and books. We need verse by verse. We need the Bible in our life every day 
Secondly, private reading and small group discussions are needed. Folks, I believe that every Christian ought to be part of a small group, where it's uh, friends in your home or whether it's Sunday school. I strongly encourage Sunday school. We have a great Sunday school program here. Come be a part of Christians who gather around the Word and they read it and they discuss it. But lastly, I think many Christians need to evaluate our use of our time. If God's word is what sanctifies us, if it's what convicts us, if it's what leads us to holiness and to a greater knowledge of God, then that can only mean this is one of the most or should be one of the most important things in my life. But it takes the back burner far too often. Folks, we need to evaluate our time. We're busy. I'm busy. Trust me. I understand busyness. But every Christian, folks, we've got to be intentional about this. We got to fight for this. We got to fight for this like we fight for ball practice. We got to fight for this like we fight for our clubs and our gatherings. And we got to fight for this, yes, like we fight for our work. If this has to do with our very own soul, it ought to be at the top of our list. We've got to fight to protect and defend time alone with God. We got to do that. And so I close this morning asking you, has God performed this gracious cutting on your heart? Have you come to terms with who and what God's word says you are and what it says he is? And folks, I pray today that if you've not allowed God's word to do some cutting, that your heart will soften and warm to the truth of God's word and that you'll let him do some surgery this morning and that you'll repent of sin. You'll trust him. If you've never been baptized and professed Jesus Christ, that you'll do that, that you'll obey his word, profess him before men so that he will profess you before the Father. That if you've not joined a body of believers, profess Christ to that body and, and, and join them and commit it to be active and faithful to the, to the church, to the bride of Christ. If you've not acknowledged him as your Lord and your Savior, or Christian, if you've got sin and you're playing with it, you think it'll be okay. If any of that's you, then you need some gracious cutting right now. But God's Word can do that. Let's pray. Stand with me, please. Father, Lord, I pray that your Word would uh, work right now and Lord that your word would do what it does if there's someone today that needs some surgery some cutting in their heart Lord I pray they surrender to you right now and that your word is effective and it's in Jesus name Amen